Hi, welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a more in-depth look at false imprisonment. But first of all, if you're just joining our legal community, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so that you don't miss out on new videos. So false imprisonment is the unlawful imposition of constraint on another's freedom of movement from a particular place, as defined in Collins and Wilcock of 1984. Whilst the term imprisonment suggests that the person is detained indoors in some form or another, that's not necessary. A person could be falsely imprisoned in a broad, wide open space if they are prevented from leaving that space by any kind of barrier, any kind of guard, any kind of threat of legal process, or any other detention within that open space that's deemed to be unlawful. False imprisonment is a common law offence and amounts to a tort or civil wrong. But an act of false imprisonment may in itself amount to an assault. An act of false imprisonment is established on two principles. First of all, the fact of the imprisonment itself. And secondly, the absence of lawful authority to justify that imprisonment. And when considering these, the imprisonment would amount to a complete lack of liberty for any amount of time, however short. For example, even standing in a doorway to prevent someone leaving only for a few seconds can amount to false imprisonment. In a fairly recent case, the Supreme Court has held that imprisonment can have a fairly broad meaning. This would include any physical barriers, such as locks and bars, physical people, such as guards or anyone preventing you from leaving, any kind of threats, including those threats of a legal process. In this particular case, decided by the Supreme Court, the complainant was subject to an unlawful curfew, whereby he'd been electronically tagged and threatened that if he were to break the curfew, that he would be subject to a £5,000 fine or imprisonment up to six months, or both. So in these circumstances, whilst he wasn't physically prevented from leaving the premises, he felt that he was prevented from doing so. The Supreme Court held that the idea that he was free to come and go as he pleased was completely unreal. Although it should be contrasted that a requirement to live at a specific address would not amount to imprisonment by itself. It should also be said that mere interference with freedom of movement would not by itself amount to false imprisonment. For example, if a road is blocked and you would have to turn around to take a different route, that wouldn't amount to false imprisonment. However, there would be a completely different argument if the road was blocked intentionally to prevent you from leaving and there was no other route to escape. In another case, a claimant was invited to wait in a waiting room by two fellow employees, while a third called the police. It was held that there was an intention to restrict his liberty and therefore an imprisonment had occurred. So the intention of the parties is another important factor to consider. For example, if there's been a physical blockage and there's clear evidence of intention to restrict freedom of movement or liberty, these are all going to be considered together to determine whether or not there was a false imprisonment. Equally important is that a claimant doesn't necessarily need to know that they are being detained without their consent at the time. For example, if you're just being asked to wait somewhere, whereas the real intention is to keep you there. And in other cases, you might be drunk or asleep or not of sound mind, and imprisonment can still occur. And as Lord Griffiths put it in Murray and the Ministry of Defence, the law attaches supreme importance to the liberty of the individual, and if he suffers a wrongful interference with that liberty, it should remain actionable even without proof of special damage. So looking at lawful authority or lack of lawful authority, it doesn't matter whether a defendant honestly or reasonably believed that he had lawful authority. What matters is whether there was in fact lawful authority or not. In other words, it's one of these situations that we call strict liability. Although what is important and must be demonstrated is that a defendant must have had the intention to detain somebody. This would very often be shown by a deliberate act to block an escape route or with the doorway example to physically stand in the doorway. This would amount to an intention to prevent a person from leaving a particular place. Leading on from that, it must be shown that if a claimant were to attempt to leave the premises, the defendant would have taken steps to prevent him from doing so. And finally, there are some situations where you enter a premises knowing that there are certain restrictions on your freedom. For example, when you take a flight, as a passenger, you cannot insist on getting off the plane whilst the plane is in mid-flight. 
There are some other interesting situations, of course, that have come before the courts, such as Cobbett and Gray, where an inmate was kept in a prison in a place where inmates are not normally supposed to be kept, and this was held to be false imprisonment. There are, of course, also rules under the Police and Criminal Evidence Act about the duration which the police can hold somebody in custody, and which define the conditions that he may be detained. Section 40, for example, provides for regular reviews of police detention, but I feel this subject may well deserve a full video by itself, so make sure you subscribe for that one. I will also discuss the time limits on police detention, which are in sections 41 to 45. In close connection with false imprisonment, you might also be interested in watching my video on citizen's arrest. Citizen's arrest allows a person to arrest another person when they are committing or they reasonably believe they are committing an indictable offence. However, if you were to get this wrong, you may well face allegations of false imprisonment yourself. Because if you were to apply the principles I've set out in this video, there will have been a detention of some sorts, and if that turns out to be unlawful, there may well be arguments for false imprisonment. Although the courts do generally look favourably upon members of the public, trying to keep the peace and protect rights and freedoms of others, it is worth being very careful about when you exercise citizen's arrest. So I'll link that video in the description below, and I'll put a card above if you'd like to watch that one. And just a brief word about parents and children. Parents are unlikely to face difficulties with false imprisonment, however, pay particular attention if there are child arrangement orders involved or any other legal arrangement whereby there's a guardian involved or any other arrangement as to where the child lives. And as always, make sure you seek formal legal advice and do not rely on this video or any other video or article that you read. You must seek formal legal advice in each situation, as every situation is different and each case turns on its own facts. In the meantime, I hope this has provided an interesting look into some of the case law on false imprisonment. Make sure you subscribe and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.